Hello and welcome to another episode of Max Punk Photos Neurotransmissions Podcast. I'm Joe Schumacher, joined as always by my co-host, Dr. Leslie Colgan. How's it going, Leslie? It's going great. How are you, Joe? Uh, I'm great um, because we have a really interesting story to talk about today um, coming from Baylor College of Medicine. Um, Dr. Debo Sardar is here to talk about um, her really fascinating study of the intersection between genes, behavior, astrocytes, uh, epigenetics, mm -hmm. so many uh, converging fields in one really fascinating story. And we're really here, uh, happy to have you here to talk about that today. Um, so um, Dr. Sardar is a K99 postdoctoral researcher in the lab of Ben Deneen at Baylor College of Medicine. And uh, welcome to the show. Thank you for Frank. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, and thank you for doing this. This is such a great thing. I've actually never sat at a podcast before, so I'm this very first excited time for to be here and share my story. Awesome! Yeah, we're we're really we're really happy to have you. Um, uh, Dr. Sardar is here as actually part of our NeuroMeets um, series, seminar series. Leslie, can you tell us a little bit about this? Because you, you're kind of involved in organizing. Absolutely, yeah. So we have this great NeuroMeets seminar series where we um, get to highlight the incredible research that's being done um, by trainees outside of the Institute. Um, it's open, of course, to postdocs who are, um, like Dr. Sardar, getting ready to head out on the job market or already on the job market looking to start labs of their own. But it's also open to graduate students, and um, we're actually accepting applications for graduate students now. So if you are a graduate student um, who's looking to sort of move on to the next stage of your career, um, check out the link that's um, in the description of the podcast, and please apply. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, so definitely apply um, if you're out there um, interested in coming down to Florida, being on the podcast, and, and, and sharing your science with us. Um, um, so, Dr. Sardar, you have a really interesting career trajectory. Before we get into the actual research that you're doing, one of the things that blew me away was your first slide, which is this crazy-looking marine organism, mm -hmm. a sponge. You have a background in medical chemistry. That's sort of, I think, what you did your PhD yes, in. Yes, medicinal in? chemistry. Medicinal ke chemistry. So, tell us a little bit about sponges. <laughs> so, what, what, what is it with uh, marine organisms and having really useful attributes that we can find uh, use for in the labs or in medicine in general? Tell us a little bit about your, your PhD work. So the thing about sponges is they harbor these uh, symbiotic bacteria, so bacteria that live with them. And these bacteria make a lot of really cool compounds. And a whole bunch of them are potential drug-like molecules. So it's essentially this marine system is a source of drugs. And many of you might not know this, but more than 50% of currently approved drugs are either directly from nature, like their chemical structure is directly a natural product, or the structure is inspired by nature. So nature is this huge source of drugs. So it's just sort of like a high throughput screening, like nature itself is a high throughput screening assay for finding that's potential molecules that a, we can use for drugs. That's a beautiful way of putting it. I, I think that's a really cool way of putting it because the compounds that we were studying, uh, so these pathways in bacteria, so these single pathways, they can, like one pathway, they're designed in such a way that they can make hundreds of compounds. So each, path, each pathway is actually making a library of compounds. So in a way, it's high throughput. And the enzymology of these pathways is designed in such a way that they're very promiscuous. So that was my PhD where we were asking, is how are these enzymes so promiscuous enzymes, like basic biochem, the way we think about enzymes is they're very specific for a substrate. They see a substrate, they only find their substrate, and they act fast and do their job. But these pathways, these enzymes, they have affinity for a lot of substrates. So they're broad substrate. So they're not very fast, they're slow, but that allows them to be promiscuous. So they can process like hundreds of compounds. So what we could do is move these pathways from these bacteria in the sponge to E. coli in the lab. And then we could engineer these pathways and essentially use E. coli to make drugs for us. And not one or two drugs. You can essentially do libraries using E. coli, do it high throughput. So mil like potentially millions of compounds. So you take the bacteria from the sponges, you find out 
basically specific things from them and get them to be expressed in a different type of bacteria. Exactly. So what we do is, uh, so we cannot grow these bacteria because they're symbiotic. They live with the sponge, so we can't grow them in the lab. So we take help of sequencing technology, so we sequence them. So we sequence both the, sp like everything, both the sponge and the bacteria, but then there are methods by which you can figure out uh, what is the bacterial sequence and then go deeper to knowing, like we know what the chemistry is from the bacteria, we will do like HPLC, my spec to figure out the chemistry first, and then look at the sequence to connect what are the genes driving that chemistry. And once you find these genes, these pathways, which are usually clusters of genes, you take that pathway, those set of genes, and express it in E. coli. So what you're taking from the sponge is essentially those genes and putting it in E. coli and make E. coli make the drugs for you. So it was a really, really cool PhD. And yeah, it's um, fascinating. Um, it's so surprising that even just the knowledge that this symbiotic bacteria exists is out there. Like, So somebody had to go discover that there's this symbiotic relationship and then from there like, look at what these bacteria do. Yeah, so like, um, back in the 80s, I think one of the first papers was Chris Ireland's lab back in the 80s showing that these sponges are making these really cool compounds. And I did my PhD in Eric Schmidt's lab. He was one of the first to figure out, like we can take these pathways from these sponges and identify which pathway is linked to which product, which chemical, and express those pathways in E. coli. So there's a whole field now, it's synthetic biology, and you can do it in so many different ways. But what we were essentially was doing synthetic biology, we didn't call it that at the time, uh, back in the day. Uh, but now I think that broadly, that's what's known as. It's flashy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Yeah, but and I, yeah, yeah go, go ahead. ahead. I, um, I'm just interested then how you ended up making the jump to neuroscience and where you ended up um, in your postdoc. Yeah, that's exactly what I was getting at because oh. I really <laughs> wanted to talk about it. Uh, so I've always uh, been fascinated by the brain. I've always wanted to be a neuroscientist. So when I joined my PhD program, what everybody, so we do rotations, right, before you pick a lab. And what everyone tells you is your first rotation, like don't do it in a lab you want to join because you just moved. Like for me, I moved countries. You're settling down, you're doing classes, there's so much happening. So do it in a lab just for fun, uh, where you, like we're not serious about joining the lab. So I remember, like, I still have a very clear memory of this, like, sitting, I was, I did my PhD from Utah, so sitting by the mountains and looking at the brochure, like, what is a cool lab that I'll have some fun doing science at, and I saw Eric's lab, and I reached out to him, I did my first rotation with him, I loved it, and I did do neuroscience rotations after that, and I was so drawn to what I did in Eric's lab, and I remember at the end of my rotations when I had to choose a lab, I was in such a big dilemma, like should I pick the lab where I had fun or should I pick the lab that I really want to do in the future? And I chose fun <laughs> and <laughs> I have no regrets. <laughs> and uh, it's been like, when, of course PhD is hard in so many ways. My papers got rejected, like yeah. all of that happened as a grad student. But looking back I, I was I enjoyed every moment of it like there were hard times but the science itself was so crazy I think I learned about one of the most fascinating biochemical pathways that exist in nature so after my PhD I knew if I really want to study the brain I had to make a move then mm -hmm. and like later it would just become harder so that's when I decided to shift to neuroscience but what drove me is I have to join a neuroscience lab, but I still have to be in a lab that does it at a molecular level. Because when we're thinking about genetics and genes, the language is the same, even across systems, it's a universal language. So that really drew me to Ben Denin's lab, because I think the beauty of his lab is we're looking at the level of genes and proteins and what it's doing. So although I'm looking at the brain and doing neuroscience, it's very, very molecular. So the concepts are still the same. Like I said, it's universal language. And although it was very hard, like the first two years <laughs> was miserable, it took me a while to learn and get used to it. But the having that kind of background where I'm always thinking about the chemistry and the genes, I think, has been very helpful to be where I am today. One thing that really strikes me about uh, your research is that it 
it really goes to literally it kind of goes to the extremes of neuroscience where uh, on one level you're dealing with like the molecular level genetics and you know all this stuff and then at the macro level you're talking about how animals behave and I think it seemed like one of the central questions that you're that has motivated your current research is what are genes that uh, what is the impact of specific genes on information processing in the way that it can kind of serve the animal for behavioral purposes and really trying to draw a strong link, not just between genes and cell physiology, but genes and ultimately behavior in general. Um, you focus on glia. And, and mm -hmm. we, we said, like, you've made this transition from uh, uh, from chemistry to neuroscience. I guess more accurately is kind of glial, glial neuroscience. Glial <laughs> science. So um, what was it about understanding the role of astrocytes as central to this link between genes and behavior that that was a hook for you so to be honest when i was looking for labs i wasn't really thinking of joining a glia lab i was only looking for labs where i can do molecular neuroscience mm -hmm. so definitely a lab doing like ephys and patch clamp was like out of question mm -hmm. so it had to be a lab doing molecular and that drew me to ben's lab and that that's, so I wasn't thinking of studying astrocytes, it just happened. I ended up there and of course I fell in love with astrocytes and now it's what I want to do. I uh, Ideally, I'm going to set up my research program on astrocytes and epigenetics and sensory processing, but I really do want to work with hardcore neuroscientists and electrophysiologists so I can start expanding into, I'm looking at glia, but how is that affecting circuits? and more uh, de the finer details of how neuron neuron talking to each other and how the glia is fitting into that. So one of the first experiments that you described was kind of if we see increases in neural activity, which we can induce artificially or exogenously, what is the impact on gene expression in general? And you know, you focused on the olfactory bulb, also focused largely on gene expression mm -hmm. in astrocytes. Um, can you describe a little bit the, the motivation behind those experiments, uh, particularly the chemogenetic experiments where you activate neurons, and then um, what did you find when you started looking at upregulated and downregulated genes in astrocytes that, you, that was surprising? So I think the first surprising thing was uh, we were seeing a lot of changes in genes. Like in neurons, it's known. When the neurons are firing, there's a lot of genes up going up and down. That's the whole field of immediate early genes. Mm -hmm. So to, to observe that in astrocytes, just in terms of numbers, not in terms of like what genes, just in terms of numbers, we were also seeing a very robust change in what's going up and what's going down. And what is going up and down was very different from neurons. So they clearly had their own program that was designed uh, to drive this process. I think to me, at the first step, that was really cool because then we had gene sets to pursue further. So you did this screen where you basically, if I understood correctly, um, increased the activity in neurons, and then you <coughs> looked at the different genes that were changing in astrocytes, either going up or going down. And you saw a lot of different changes that were unique from neurons, unique from other areas of the brain. <laughs> so how did you go about then narrowing down which genes that were altered you were going to focus on? So that's a good question, and anybody who does bioinformatics in the audience will know it's great to do those experiments, but you can also drown in the data because it's a lot of data. It's so easy to get lost and never find ground. So the approach we took was threefold, and I think this is really important if you're doing any kind of screen to have some kind of idea beforehand, like how, how you're going to narrow it down. So the first was, uh, so Ben's lab, we're a transcription factor lab. So we took, uh, we made use of our expertise essentially, where we asked, like we have all these genes, but what transcription factor is driving the regulation of these genes? And that led us to SOX9. So we had our first hook. We had SOX9, and we used SOX9 to narrow down our candidates. I think we went down from uh, somewhere in the range of 250 to 40. So let's just take a step back. SOX9 actually is a transcription factor, correct? Yes. Is it only in astrocytes? Or? Yes, it's an astrocyte-specific transcription factor. It's expressed all over the brains, but it's very, very uh, specific to astrocytes. Okay, so when you are activating the neurons, you are actually seeing upregulation of uh, this. So that's a... Um, so we don't really see upregulation of SOX9. What we saw 
was change in DNA binding of SOX9. So the target SOX9 was binding, was changing. So this is very different from FOS, because FOS is baseline, like FOS is a neuronal activity marker. Baseline, there's no FOS, and there's activation, FOS goes up. SOX9 is present, like at normal levels too. And activated levels, it's about the same. but. But the binding capacity of SOX9 was changing. So which gene it was binding and regulating was completely uh, very, very different. And we used that to narrow in on a smaller target. And then we used a SOX9 knockout model that we had in the lab to really validate those further. And we finally validated it in our dread experiments. So we were following a candidate that was SOX9 regulated only after dread that was down-regulated in the knockout and up-regulated after dread activation. So we had to find a candidate that checked those three boxes, and we were eventually able to land in on SLC 22F3. It sounds very easy when I said this, but this is more than two years of work. Really? This was a lot. It actually doesn't sound easy at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, like, as a, just a physiologist, I'm just like, wow. That's, like, it seems like a, a real... It's like looking for like a, a needle in a haystack that it checks yeah, up all you, these you boxes. Yeah, you really have to like do it uh, very systematic. So it took a lot, it was also a very stressful time, but here we are. So you, <laughs> you narrowed down, so would we call this SL22A3, or sorry, SLC22A3, if my notes are mm -hmm. correct, yeah. So we, would we call this like a, an immediate early gene for astrocytes then? So that's a good question. I'm afraid to call it that, just to be very accurate, because it's also present uh, baseline level. So for example, like I said, FOS baseline zero activated, mm. goes up, goes down. So with SLC, it's there at baseline level. It goes up under neuronal activity. I don't know what is the kinetics of going down. I have not checked that. But because it's also present at baseline level, I don't know if it's accurate to call it an immediate early gene. What I like calling it is it's a part of an immediate early response. Mm. And a lot of immediate early genes are also transcription factors, but uh, SLC 22A3 is not. So just to be safe, it's let's kind of call like an it an early response. Immediate already present <laughs> gene. Or, or something. I don't know. That's a nice way of putting it. Um, it, it doesn't really roll off the tongue, I would say. <laughs> but um, so I mean, when, what you notice then is like so in your your early experience, you, you were expressing dreads in neurons, activating the dreads with this compound CNO, and then you could see you know changes uh, in the astrocyte gene expression from there. You then, I think it's really great. You show like a more naturalistic setting that if you just kind of expose animals to odors yeah. in the <laughs> olfactory bulb, you where you would assume that leads to activity, you then can see like increased activity of this, of this gene, this right? Of this transporter, of yes. This transporter, yes. And yeah. I think that is a really nice, uh, good, a good, nice thing about the olfactory bulb, that we were seeing this gene in the olfactory bulb, so we could do that very natural experiment. And I want to add one thing here. Um, that experiment, the natural odor exposure, I had actually proposed it in my K99 grant as part of my R00, which is like the independent section had proposed it that I'll do it in the future. And one of my reviewers, I don't know who he is or she is, I really want to thank that anonymous person. One of my reviewers was like, this is a really good experiment and should be one of the first things you do mm -hmm. and not later into the future. And I remember when I saw that comment, I was like, yeah, this person is right, I'm going to do it. So that led me to read some papers and design it, and I'm so glad. It wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's um, good to hear about a positive review yeah, experience. Yeah, it's great. Though. Sometimes <laughs> the reviewers out there they can be really constructive, honestly. Yes, um, that was very constructive. So you described SLC22A3. It's a transporter. What else do we know about this this thing? So, so des describe what that means by transporter and functionally what we think like so, b before you did anything with it, what you, what you knew about it. So it's been really well studied in the peripheral nervous system and also in the central nervous system, a little bit in astrocytes too, and very broadly it transports uh, serotonin, dopamine, noradrenaline, and other chemicals with that similar chemical class. And um, so what it does is maintain homeostasis of these chemicals in the brain. And it is... a uh, Low affinity transporter, so but it's broad. So what that means, it, it the, the compound, it has low affinity for its chemical, but it needs to be there in a lot of volume for it to be able hmm. to transport. 
So that is uh, what is what was known when I started, but its role in olfactory bulb astrocytes was completely unknown. And so it was a really nice target to follow. And my chemist background is really interested in chemicals like serotonin and dopamine. So I remember as soon as I saw it, I was like, this is it. This is the one I'm going to follow. So then how do you decide, you know, I want to assess the function of this thing in astrocytes. Like wh what are what are sort of the breakdown of the main areas or the, the main set of experience you would want to do to see, like, what does this do if I say get rid of it, like knock it out or something? Yes, so the next experiment is like classical, make a knockout mouse, and we, we do everything conditional knockout, so we're knocking it out only in astrocytes. And the next set of experiment really comes from the lab I am in and the expertise we have. Ben has done a really good job in building these pipelines to study, and we can do this in the lab. And we look at it at different levels. We go molecular, so we can do RNA seq. So we looked at how knocking out this gene was ex uh, was changing molecular profiles of astrocytes. We look at the cellular level, so we could look at how the astrocyte morphology was, how astrocyte calcium signaling was, and we also looked at neurons, where we did ef ef electrophysiology with the colleague. And of course, behaviors, which was very convenient because now we're in the olfactory bulb, so we can do behaviors related to olfactory processing. So I think the next series, this whole pipeline of experiments, really comes from where I was and the tools available around me being in Ben's lab to push it forward. Yeah, it's great that you really had such a comprehensive toolkit to work with and you could really you know, go after all these different types of changes. So maybe let's walk through a little bit what you found. So mm -hmm. let's start maybe with the molecular changes that you found. So the molecular changes were crazy. Uh, so we did we not, uh, so we did the knockout and then we RNA seq so sorted so purified astrocytes and RNA seq control and knockout astrocytes and we saw close to 1500 differentially expressed genes which is a lot. Like usually when I do RNA seq I see somewhere in the level of 2 3 400 max. I think 1500 was a lot. So that was really one of the first hints, like this is a transporter, transporting chemicals, yes, but it's doing much more, doing something much more widespread than that, because these genes were all in different classes, like morphology and calcium, synaptic. Uh, so I think that was like an early hint, like th th there's a big widespread function somewhere. Okay, so before we sort of get at the punchline, let's talk about some of the other changes that might have served as hints. Um, how about um, morphological changes that you saw in the astrocytes? So we observed from our RNA-seq data that we um, saw down-regulation of genes associated with like cytoskeletal structure. I don't remember top of my head what those were. So what we, uh, what we did was do a shoal analysis. What we essentially do there is section brains take really high resolution images and you run it through softwares that can like track all the processes and give it numbers. You can do things like branch length, filament length, uh, and how many branches as you're moving away from the soma. So a lot of, it just gives you a lot of parameters. We're scientists, we like seeing things, data broken down to numbers. And what we saw was reduced numbers like all different levels of reduced numbers essentially the astrocytes were smaller and less bushy is what we saw with the morphology and as you mentioned you also saw changes in actually neuronal electrophy electrophysiological properties yes we saw changes in synaptic currents and more importantly we saw changes in behavior and again i want to uh, i keep reiterating this is we were knocking out this gene from astrocytes only and yet we were seeing changes in circuits and behaviors. So what that tells you is knocking out this gene was also knocking out the ability of the astrocytes to talk to the neurons, and then the neurons were not being able to function properly, and therefore we're seeing these changes at a circuit level and a behavior level. Yeah, actually, so this kind of is then the bridge from genes to behavior. Then you have this one critical gene that sort of when knocked out disrupts so much about how the olfactory bulb functions seemingly. How do you test uh, the animal, like the behavioral level for, for an animal? So in the olfactory bulb, where we, we would assume this is important for detecting odorants and things like that. Um, how do you get a mouse to tell you it can't smell or can <laughs> smell or vice versa? Yeah, that's a good question. So I did very standard established assays of the olfactory field. It's called a three-chamber assay. 
So what you do is you place a mouse in the center of the chamber and you'll have odor or no odor in different sites. And what the mouse will do is it'll start exploring. So when the mouse sees an odor, it will go and start sniffing it versus a no odor on the other side is not really so interested. So what we do is there's a camera on top that will record this movement and the time it's spending in each chamber or the time it's spending to uh, sniff the odor. And again, we can convert all those movements to numbers that is essentially a quantification of what is a preference for the mouse for an odor. So if it has a differential amount of time <laughs> in mm -hmm. different chambers, then it obviously has some kind of preference. acknowledgement yes. that, this, that there's exactly. a, a difference in the smell. So it's, it's technically, it's a zone preference index. If there's an odor versus a no odor, it's going to spend more time and have a higher zone preference index for that zone compared to the other zone. So just a way of quantifying that is how you can tell if, it is, if it's being able to smell it. And then for discrimination, you do a series of habituation and put different odors in the two different chambers and ask, can it discriminate between the two? Right. So that in and of itself is an interesting story. You've like bridged this huge divide between animal behavior and important genes for you know, the structure and function of astrocytes and then how they contribute to like the overall neural circuit of olfactory bulb, like <laughs> bing, bang, boom, beautiful <laughs> story. But it goes, it keeps going. So you mentioned that this transporter is involved in um, uh, the, the transport of uh, lots of different neurotransmitters, including serotonin, dopamine, I think you maybe said. Noradrenaline. Uh -huh. yeah. So, um, w okay, so this is where, for me, it gets kind of crazy, and you get into the realm of epigenetics. You, <laughs> you noted that not only is serotonin um, important in the way that we traditionally think about it as like involved in anxiety and depression, binds to serotonin receptors, et cetera. But it, there's this other thing going on with serotonin that's critically function, uh, critically important in the function of the brain. Ter tell us a little bit about serotonilation and what brought you around to thinking that there might be something there going on with these astrocytes as well. Yeah, I love answering this question. I always get it, and uh, I would say it was a good timing. A series of things happened at the right time. So around the time I found the transporter and we were starting to see all these phenotypes, I thought, this is great. I'm going to have a paper now. But I was really curious, like, how it's doing, what it's doing. And like I keep saying, the chemist in me was really attracted to the concept that these transporters is transporting chemicals in and out. And there could be a role for these chemicals in astrocytes. And what I'm really interested in serotonin, it's such a cool molecule. It's like so fascinating. So I had a hook for serotonin. And around the time I was thinking about this is when I came across Ian's paper where he showed that histone serotonilation is a thing. It exists like this crazy phenomenon where serotonin can actually become an epigenetic mark and control gene expression. So this was great. I still remember I saw the paper somewhere 2019, uh, 2020, I don't remember. And I, t I got the antibodies and I tried to stain it and, and s just see if it's expressed in, in olfactory bulb, in, in my knockouts and all of that. And the first series of experiments didn't work. I could actually never get to uh, see a good signal. And I think just one or two months after I failed Ian, he came to give a talk at my institute. Oh, perfect. <laughs> so I went to talk to him. And I was like, I'm trying this, it's not working. And he was like, oh, did you try this antibody? You're trying the other one. And I was like, no. And then I also told him I have this transporter, and I think it could be linked to histone serotonilation. And he is the one who pointed out it's a great idea because the transporter, the way it's expressed, it's on the plasma membrane, and it's also on the nuclear membrane. So it's a nice bridge between what's outside the cell and what's going into the nucleus. So Ian's excitement and him helping me, like leading me, nudging me into the right direction. So I went and I got the right antibodies. He shared protocols with me too of how they do their staining. And then, I, and then it eventually worked. And it became a beautiful collaboration that went on further. So I think uh, I was very fortunate in having the timing, the sequence of events uh, just working out. Because if Ian didn't come to give a talk, I might have been like, oh, it's just one of those things that don't work. I'm going to do the other thing. So 
I think that was really the critical moment that he was there and I could just go and talk to him yeah, and him being very supportive. It's a lot of <coughs> factors mm -hmm. align, like the stars are kind of aligning to make sure that somebody who's curious about this question has the answers. Yeah, you know, and, and uh, he was like right there to talk to and he was very supportive. I think that was also a big thing. Like he could easily have been like, oh, I don't know. But he was like, oh, no, let's look at it. That's a great idea. That sounds very exciting. And he help me go through the technical difficulties and figure it out. So just to unpack a, a little bit of what we just discussed um, for the listeners. So you mentioned epigenetics. And actually, I don't know that on this podcast we've had a, I, I hope I'm not blanking. I don't know that we've had a, a specific discussion of what epigenetics is and why it's important in the brain specifically. But, um, you know, I think one of the conventional uh, almost sort of pop science understanding of epigenetics is it's thought to be really important in like transgenerational inheritance. So like how do you, uh, how does the experience of your parents influence their germline that, to get passed on mm -hmm. to you? And you hear about things like histone methylation and, and stuff like that. So there's this kind of like long-term effect of epigenetic mechanisms that can impact generations yeah. of a, an mm -hmm. organism and then what you're describing here almost sounds like kind of acute effects of 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 epigenetic mechanisms so can you like sort of broadly speaking describe like under putting all of this under umbrella what is epigenetics and and what has to happen and, and what what are the consequences at the level of like dna and, and transcription and that sort of thing so in the field of epigenetics i think different people have different definitions uh so the pop science one where it's transmitted to the next generation is of course a very popular one whether the phenomenon i'm observing is going to transmit to the next generation i don't know because it's a short like the time I like I was saying in my talk the time is such a hard question like mm -hmm. how long do I have to do whatever I'm doing for it to be actually able to transmit so that's one definition but the definition I personally like is looking at it at from a chemical standpoint that if there's a histone post translational modification so what post translational modification means like you have a peptide so it's translated after translation if there's a chemical getting added onto the peptide that's a post translational so on histone not a peptide a protein is probably a better word so on histone you're having this post translational modification of a methyl or an acetyl or a serotonin getting added so you're having this modification so what that does, remember histones wrap around DNA. So when you're having this chemical modification, you're loosening the DNA that it's wrapping, wrapping around, and then the DNA is free for other things to come in and start working on the DNA to make it RNA and make it protein. So personally, that's the definition I like from a chemical standpoint because when I was working on chemistry in sponges, what I actually studied was post-translational modifications on peptides from these sponges. So that's my personal favorite definition. Another definition I like is, so you're not seeing changes in the genes per se, the genetic encoding is actually the same. So DNA code is not changing, it's the regulation of the code that's changing through this epigenetic modification that's important. Gotcha, and so serotonin doesn't just bind to serotonin receptors and modulate neural activity at the synapse, it can also get <laughs> incorporated exactly. into the histones and m modify like the use of DNA basically for exactly. creating Exactly, and, and, and Ian, Ian Mays' work, he's in Mount Sinai, his, his work is the one to follow. Mm -hmm. He's the one who first showed it and like done beautiful work on it afterwards and how it's happening. And this is the first example of it being in glial cells. One thing that I found really interesting from your talk um, was that the enzyme that actually carries out serotonin is al actually calcium dependent. Yes. So it sort of gives an idea that, you know, these would be activity dependent modifications. Yes. <laughs> and that's a hypothesis I have. It needs to be tested, and I do want to test it once I have my lab. And I think the enzyme being calcium dependent really drives that that like this is likely a very activity dependent process because when there's activity there's calcium elevation and that could directly uh, target activity of this enzyme so for, for from what i remember i don't remember seeing changes in the expression levels of the enzyme but you can't measure activity from expression 
Right, so that's a hypothesis I do want to test. And I think it's clear, it's a nice link between activity and this enzyme, acti- like neuronal activity, enzyme activity, and what's happening in the genome. So kind of putting it all together then, what is your, what is your understanding of how serotonin of uh, in, in astrocytes is regulating neural activity in a way that makes smells more or less um, detectable, basically. Like yes, so what we saw is um, we're seeing regulation uh, by serotonin right? So it's a histone mark regulating different genes. So what these genes were, a major hub of these genes were GABA, and we think it's GABA biosynthesis because we saw reduction of these genes that make GABA and astrocytes. So what we think is happening is that the astrocytes are making less GABA, so there's less release of GABA from astrocytes, and that's leading to less inhibition of the neuron. So in a natural scenario, what's happening is serotonin comes in, GABA goes out, and inhibits the neuron, feedback inhibition, so it's tonic inhibition. So if we take a step back and think about, like, everything I told you is in this condition of where we're knocking out something or mutating something. So if we take a step back and see what's actually happening, what we think is going on, this is our model, is that there's neuronal activity. Right? So when the mice is smelling an odor, there's serotonin release from the neurons in the olfactory bulb. That serotonin is being picked up by astrocytes through this transporter, and the transporter is transporting that serotonin from outside to the nucleus. In the nucleus, that serotonin is getting added to histones, and it's regulating genes, and it's actually regulating uh, the biosynthesis of GABA in astrocytes. So now the astrocytes have more GABA inside, and it's releasing the GABA. So remember, the neurons are firing here so in the olfactory bulb, so the GABA is now going in and inhibiting the neurons. So kind of like a feedback inhibition. So I think what the astrocytes are essentially doing is when the neurons are firing, the astrocytes are like, okay, you need to calm down and putting them down. And this is a role of our glia that has been shown in many different systems, and not just astrocytes, for other glial cells too, where they're modulating neuronal activity. They're either helping neurons, inhibiting neurons, and to- toning down too much activity, or doing the opposite in exciting neurons. So I think what's nice about my work is we have figured out an epigenetic mechanism that is driving this modulation of neurons by glia. So this is like a really fascinating story. And like most scientific stories, it also, you know, brings to mind so many additional questions, right? And I know you're, you know, looking to start your own lab and are probably excited about a lot of these, um, you know, continuing questions. Maybe you can tell us about what you're, some of the things that you're most excited about starting right away. Yes, I'm so excited to start my own lab. I can't wait to dig into this. I think this is such fascinating biology and we have like only touched the surface. There's so much more to know and I'm, I'm just so excited. So one of the first questions I want to get into is, is there a direct relationship between neuronal activity and serotonin And some preliminary data I have suggests that, which is great because now I'll have gene targets to pursue. But in terms of characterizing this further, I really get the time question a lot. What is the dynamics of this process? Like, if there's activity, and especially this natural odor evoked activity, when is is serotonin increasing? Is there a range of it increasing or going down? And how is the the gene regulation changing over time? So it essentially gives you a lot of genetic data, gene expression level data that you can take and move forward with. And you have this very nice behavioral readout of sense of smell where we can start connecting. So that's one part, just characterizing this biology further because we have to know more. It's so very fascinating. Awesome. Well, um, Dr. Sardar, I, we're going to have to move you on to your next thing at this point, but thank you so much for walking us through your science. It's really fast, a really fascinating story. Um, so many different converging approaches and areas of, of research. Each of them is probably interesting even by themselves in a vacuum. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Good luck um, setting up that lab. And uh, maybe after your your lab is up and running, we'll get you back on here to talk about uh, life as a new PI. <laughs> thank you. I would love to do that. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching today. If you like this video podcast, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool neuroscience.